Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural Ask the Expert series presented by DermTech, our first Ask the Expert in 2021. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Kylie Lapira. I'm the CEO of the Melanoma Research Foundation, and we're so excited to present this series in January, which is sponsored generously by DermTech, our wonderful partner who also partnered with us in May of last year during Melanoma Awareness Month. So today we're really excited to kick off the series and provide you with a little bit of an overview of what Ask the Expert is. So for those of you who don't know, this series is streamed live through the MRF's Facebook page where we bring in experts to address concerns, questions for patients either battling melanoma or at risk for melanoma. And it's a wonderful educational series and we hope you will join us every Thursday in the month of January. As I mentioned, this series is presented by DermTech, our wonderful industry sponsor. DermTech is a leader in precision dermatology enabled by a non-invasive skin genomics platform. And they're very excited to partner with the MRF series this year. This series will focus on the importance of early detection, as well as the delays in skin cancer screenings and diagnosis due to the COVID-19 pandemic. DermTech is a leader in genomics and dermatology and is creating a new category in medicine called precision dermatology, enabled by their non-invasive skin genomics platform. Their mission is to transform dermatology with their non-invasive skin genomics platform to dem democratize access to high quality dermatology care and to improve the lives of millions impacted by skin cancer. DermTech provides genomic analysis of skin samples collected non-invasively using an adhesive patch rather than a scalpel. DermTech markets and develops products that facilitate the early detection of skin cancers and is developing products that assess inflammatory diseases and customize drug treatment options. As many of you know, the Melanoma Research Foundation is committed to education. We truly believe that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care. That is why we are thrilled to partner with DermTech on this series and on our Ask the Expert educational series, which aims to touch on topics to help educate and empower the melanoma community. Today is our first session and it's gonna be focused on the importance of understanding genomics and non-invasive testing. We are thrilled to have Dr. Neil Bhatia join us today. He is a board certified dermatologist based out in San Diego, California. He is the director of clinical dermatology at the Therapeutics Clinical Research Lab, and he's the chief medical editor for practical dermatology. He has a background in immunology and has interests in mechanisms of therapy, skin cancer, and medical dermatology. Aside from teaching at medical conferences, which he's probably doing virtually these days, he sits on several editorial boards and is an active teacher for dermatologists, industry partners, and patients. I hope you will all join me in welcoming Dr. Bhatia. Just a couple few housekeeping points that I want to encourage. We will be taking questions via our Facebook Live comments section. Please feel free to put your questions in there. Again, we will not be able to address any personal medical questions. You should be discussing those directly with your doctor. This session will last about 30 to 45 minutes, so we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If we can't get to your questions during the allotted time, we will try and do so offline. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bhatia. Well, thank you, Kylie, and a happy new year to everybody. And uh, special cheers to all the Packer fans out there. I don't know if you can see, there you go. You can see my glass. So I hope everybody's uh, doing well. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, get started going over some discussion points on melanoma and some of the things we're gonna touch on today. And some of that has to do with the way we diagnose melanoma as well as, well as some of the prognostic features of melanoma that are uh, becoming more available to us, which is very interesting science. And uh, I've done some work with DermTech as well as with um, Castle Biosciences. And they're pioneers for both the, the diagnostic genomics in the lab as well as 
what Dermatech does with some of the other uh, clinical features of, of helping physicians, especially dermatologists, make you know discussion of atypical moles and melanoma a little bit easier uh, for patients. But my last uh, bullet point is is important because I'm not a melanoma expert. I'm a dermatologist, which makes us all melanoma experts to some degree. Uh, but I'm a I'm a regular dermatologist, just like many of you who uh, are out there, or many of the patients who see regular dermatologists. And these are things we all need to be on top of. And that starts with screening. And through the Academy of Dermatology, the uh, ASDS through derm, derm surgery, through uh, the Skin Cancer Foundation and uh, SkinCancer.org, there's a lot of initiative out there for encouraging regular skin cancer screening. You know, I tell my patients just like hypertension, just like cholesterol you need to get your skin checked at least once a year. If you have a history of any kind of skin cancer that can become six months. If you have a history of melanoma, you know, there's a paradigm of every few months for a couple of years, such as, you know, every three months for two years, every six months for three years. And then every year after that, depending on risk, even patients with actinic keratosis and early signs of sun damage, we're now increasing our and lowering our threshold for screening. And as you see in the pictures, there's a lot of good information about how to do a good skin exam around the nails, back, bottom of the feet, back of the legs. Uh, I always make a joke with my patients about that old show Baywatch. And one of the ways they wrote off one of the lifeguards was they gave her melanoma on the back of her legs. And as crazy as that sounds, that actually increased a lot of awareness of skin cancer pre prevention and screening, but also a good application of sunscreen to the backs of the legs, the tops of the feet, in areas that we don't often think about. So some of this is very important and this is all available online. I think even more so it's important to recognize those features of moles on the left, uh, the symmetry, the borders, you know, being irregular, you know, something that you cannot cut in half with your eyes. Of course, the color being a little bit irregular or varied. And then of course the diameter of anything that's less than six millimeters is considered to be pretty good. But anything that's changing, evolving, or anything that is bleeding or of concern, should obviously brought to the, the attention of the dermatologist. And again, you know, skin cancer is something that can be prevented. And obviously there are people who are at higher risk and that's where some of the genomic studies come in to assess those risks, as well as some of the prognostic features of melanoma and atypical nevi. Uh, but again, some of the more common sense things, obviously I live in San Diego uh, where there, it's sunny all the time, but not necessarily warm. And one of the misconceptions is that you, you know, don't need sunscreen on a colder day, which is false. You know, it's the ultraviolet light that creates risk, not the temperature. Uh, being from Wisconsin, I can tell you that even on a cold day that's sunny, you still have to put sunscreen on. And anyone who skis or goes outdoors in the winter knows exactly what I'm saying. So again, you know, seeking shade during the times that are appropriate between 10 and 2, you know, making sure you're not outdoors excessively, wearing a protective clothing. And there are a lot of misconceptions about vitamin D. You know, there are vitamin, there's vitamin D in the diet and vitamin D supplements you know, getting vitamin D through the sun is not the answer. That's the best way to increase your risk of skin cancer. And all the myths on social media and everywhere else, they, they need to really be rebunked uh, and, and sought through. So the Academy of Dermatology has a lot of good position statements and uh, scientific literature on vitamin D, and you can get some of that online at their resource. So we're talking a little bit about melanoma. And melanoma has flavors, just like ice cream. Uh, there are some types that are more common in different ethnic groups. For example, black patients tend to get more equal antigenous. You know, you see it on the uh, fingertips or on the toes. That's unfortunately how Bob Marley passed away, was from melanoma. And he was obviously of darker skin. Superficial spreading melanoma tends to be in more fair skin patients or those who have a family tendency. Lentigo maligna, you often see on the face, around the upper, upper parts of the face near the eyes. And then nodular melanoma is actually pretty scary. There's, there's the other type that's not listed here. It's called amelanotic melanoma which shows up as a very you know, benign appearing mole, but by the time it's diagnosed, it's often spread. And nodular melanoma is one of those where I've seen where you, you take a look at it, you think, okay, let's take a biopsy of it. And before you know it, there's pigment throughout. And it's a, it's a pretty frightening uh, concept when you think it's been you know, um, sat on for some time. But we never, by the way, never like to use the word missed. We always think about melanoma as being ahead of us, right? There's always one step ahead and it's, very scary disease, which is why screening is very critical. And from that comes, you know, again, the, these diagnostic criteria and some of the other components of the studies. And, you know, think about the MSLT study at the bottom, how many patients develop metastatic disease and die when even a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy assay was performed. 
And again, those of evolutions of the disease can be pretty significant. So this is where we get, we take into account those demographics and some of those other components of our, of the condition. So again, you know, the melanoma diagnostics, I'm sorry, let's go back here. Uh, the, again, 80% of all new melanomas are stage one and they're, they can be cut out and cut out with margin and evaluated. And they usually have an excellent prognosis even 10 year out and everything else goes about 95%. So, you know, we're, we're making good strides on not only detecting melanomas early, making sure that they're completely excised out with good surgical margins and keeping those efficacy numbers high. Um, again, for those that are more advanced, central lymph node biopsy remains the standard of care. Uh, again, intermediate thickness means, you know, again, two out of the three, uh, sorry, uh, intermediate thickness means a, a little bit deeper in the skin. And again, in thinner melanomas, even some of those, you know, central lymph node biopsy assays are important uh, to make sure that they don't fall into a stage two uh, category. And the PCR has also been very important. And again, the um, decision di DX melanoma validation scale has been very important in the lab. And uh, again, with the uh, 31 genome test that uh, is part of the CASEL profile is also very important for making those diagnostics and keeping things um, on a higher level of suspicion, as well as making sure that some of those risk assessments are, are categorized correctly. So you hear about mutations. Mutations in cells or in cancers are one way that the cancer stay ahead of us, just like we hear about the viruses and virus infections that the mutations occur and then the, the new strain is more virulent. That could happen again in cancer in a different pathway, but again, the virulence or you know, equivalent in melanoma means that it's gonna be a more aggressive form and more invasive. So BRAF mutations are one set of mutations and then KIT is another one. And not to get too scientific, but BRAF mutations are found in the vast majority of melanomas that come from skin that's slightly or moderately sun damaged. You don't see it as much in melanomas that are found on the hands or palms or the lips for example, whereas kid mutations are a little less common, but they can be a little bit more aggressive. And then you see those in some of those more atypical locations of melanomas. And as you see in the graph, you know, the melanomas that occur are, are pretty diffuse in terms of you know, which mutations are actually involved. And that goes along with this chart. You see the bottom being the different mutations of the genes that are being detected. So think of these as the targets for diagnoses, for example, with the platform of something that's going to light up as positive, they're looking after these gene mutations and the cells that are from those as the products in the skin that are going to say, all right, I'm going to light up on this test because I'm positive. And as you see the timeline that uh, perhaps was an evolution from benign spots that didn't have any mutations all the way to invasive melanomas, there are variabilities of those mutations that can occur. And you see the fourth line the mutation, sorry, the fifth line, the mutation signature, how much cumulative UV radiation is involved with those exposures, right? So again, the, you know, the, the way that melanoma is diagnosed under the microscope and with laboratory testing to help, you know, obtain, you know, obtain some prognostic information is very dependent on detecting these gene mutations. So that's where these, these labels come from. And it's very important to keep those, keep those straight because it could often get confusing with the abbreviations. Now, again, you know, taking biopsies is critical, right? Taking biopsies is critical for the information, but also taking the right biopsy. You know, for example, you'll, you'll talk about uh, having a shea biopsy done or a punch biopsy done. The, the way to diagnose melanoma is to take the entire specimen and we actually label it at the north end or the proximal end of the specimen so that the pathologist is oriented to where the specimen sat on the body. So for example, if there's a melanoma that's on the middle of the chest and it's about say two centimeters long, we put a marking suture at the very proximal end, the top end to mark that so that the pathologist would know how it's oriented in the body. And that's to make sure that all the margins are clear both at the deep and the uh, lateral ends of it, which is very important to discuss in clearance. Now from that, there has been these, these studies that have been done. They looked at different cases and they looked at the accuracy and reproducibility of those studies. And you know, again, this is all for quality assurance as well as to make sure that patterns are recognized. And what they looked at for melanoma in situ, for example, which is the top layer, again, they looked at you know, the concordance of about 60% where again, looking at markers that are reproducible or as such. But you know, the flip side is again, something that's a little bit more invasive you know, we have to watch out for techniques as well as not just the 
a type of melanoma, but the staining and all the other components. So a lot of quality assurance steps. And this is why, again, I, I don't like to use the word missed or misdiagnosed or anything like that, because between the time of actual uh, excision of the specimen, the pathology processing, and the interpretation as well as staining, there are a lot of points of quality assurance that have to be observed as well as followed to make sure that everything is accurate. And that's where these steps come in to maintain that accuracy as well as see if there's anything else to the diagnosis. And that comes back to the last line, which is melanoma markers. And genomics are very important, again, not only for the typing, but also for the assessment of the future. I mean, you think about that patient who's got a little bit more advanced melanoma, their concerns are obviously longevity, but also their, con uh, their concomitant therapy or, or adjunct therapy that's potential. Any chemotherapy or any other surgery or any other tests that need to be done all, all come into play. So the pigmented lesion assay is, is an early step for us to help with those diagnostic features and help determine some outcomes. And these are molecular tests, again, you know, looking at those same mutation products, but they're also intended to ex you know, exclude the possibility of melanoma from the test and reduce the need for biopsies. Now, this is not to, again, use the word unnecessary procedures or unnecessary biopsies. This is meant to say, okay, we have a, a mole perhaps on a very cosmetic sensitive area or a patient who is reluctant to have a biopsy at first, and we have a mole that may be suspicious, we still need to gather that information. This gives us a non-invasive alternative and option to taking that information and then determining what's the next best step. And the way I describe it to, to patients who may you know, want to go this route is I say, okay, well, if we can determine some atypia from this assay, we may be able to save a step of a diagnostic biopsy and go straight to the therapeutic removal of the mole or the tumor and that will save one extra procedure and get more diagnostic, more get more diagnostic accuracy from it. So we, again, we try to avoid words like unnecessary and alternative. We try to put these all into a context of what's the best, what's going to get the best outcome for the patient as well as make the most accurate diagnosis. But there's also a cost factor to it, and you know we would have our head in the sand that you know tells us obviously this is going to have, you know lower costs when we do one less procedure or again, we're going to reduce the probability that a melanoma will get by us. So it's very important that these predictive value assays are put into our use. And again, when there's a security to it, and dermatologists understand their utility, this is where patient safety as well as patient uh, outcomes for the long run of their risk of melanoma not advancing or, or being caught early are going to be very important. So again, you know, from some of these study data, as you see, uh, this is my friend, Dr. Laura Ferris in uh, Pittsburgh. She's one of the the gurus of melanoma that I, you know, I, would, I would trust anything she writes. And what she uh, found in this study was, again, with the addition of the, of the PLA, there was increased sensitivity, which means the ability to detect melanoma. But also, you see without PLA, the reduction of the ability to exclude melanoma was poor. So again, the specificity is the ability to rule something out, versus sensitivity is the ability to rule something in. And you can see the difference here when PLA is added, what those two numbers actually improved to. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. So this is how the PLA assay works. And it, it comes in these patches, there are four of them. And they're almost like pieces of tape that get uh, adhered on, but they're a little bit more than that, obviously. What you do is you apply the, uh, the sample piece over the mole, you circle it so that it's outlined, and then you take it off, obviously with gloves. What's being taken are parts of the stratum corneum, which is the very top of the skin, obviously. And that's gonna give us enough information from the melanocytes and the keratinocytes, uh, as well as some inflammatory cells that come with it. So there's a very small amount of, of skin taken, but you see on the right, you know, what, which parts of that are taken. And that's very important for harvesting the diagnosis as well as the, um, the processing from there. What happens then is those four pieces are taken, they're put into a, a sealed envelope, uh, and that's sent to the lab where the PCR analysis is performed, and then a report comes usually within three days. And I think that's pretty reliable because that, again, gives us a chance to then make a determination on what's the next step, whether we just watch that, uh, that lesion, whether we want to cut the whole thing out, or whether we want to follow it. But at least it gives us an extra piece of information to discuss um, with the patients about what the next step is. But the, the dynamics and logistics are very easy. I mean, all we have to do is, again, you know, put it in the FedEx envelope after the, the envelope is sealed I and we take care of it. Scan at the lesion site. 
So this is my friend Brooks Buha. He's a dermatologist in San Diego. He's one of the architects of the application. And it's a video that's narrated. I'll let you follow it. Or the back of the marker to press firmly while making approximately five circular motions on the patch. Next, use the provided marker to outline the skin lesion with about a one millimeter border. This lesional area will be cut away from the surrounding tape at the DermTech laboratory. Remove the patch from the skin lesion by pulling in one direction and place the patch onto the trifold within the outlined placement areas. Again, okay. So you see there how, how simple the procedure is, but the biggest part is it's not invasive. And you, know, you get a lot of patients who are a little bit apprehensive. They, they're concerned, obviously, about the mole that's changing or their risk of skin cancer. And to talk to them about biopsies, it can, can be a little bit intimidating to some. And this procedure that's, again, non-invasive gives us that chance to say, okay, well, let's take a step further and get some more diagnostic material before we, again, think about what's the next step. So I think that's very important. And again, you see some of these statistics and you know how many moles we can actually follow just with our eyes and follow the, the, the patients closely. And you know, again, if we're, if we're concerned about it, we, we cut the whole thing out and we send that to the lab and, and go from there. And I think that's, that's really important also. But as you see in the second line, the, the, uh, the biopsies that were done did not show any differences for in 99% of the cases um, that were shown here, I'm sorry, 95% of the cases where again, they were looking at and we watched. Um, from what we compared it to the uh, to the PLA assay. So this, uh, this technology is not just being done in the skin though, which is great. I mean, it's advancing a lot of the science of, of cancer diagnostics. And, and again, in breast cancer, colorectal, thyroid, uh, cardiac and, and pulmonary malignancies, you know, we're seeing, again, where can early diagnostic changes be made from these assays? You know, the predictive tests on, you know, who's at high risk and what their potential outcomes are gonna be. Obviously, the pharmacogenetics of it come, you know, to help, you know, guide therapies, for example, and even more so, we think about, you know, the the importance of, you know, looking at um, the the potential outcomes for these patients, uh, even more so here. And you see, on some of the other uh, parts of the, oops, sorry, I'm having a little trouble there. Oh, there we go. You see again some of the objectivity and the uh, the non-invasive parts. You know, these are organs, obviously, that are very very risky for. Uh, invasive procedures for bleeding and anything else. So this is where we want to take into account, you know, the safety for the patients also. And again, the gene expression and some of the other mutations that go along, you, you see the follow through here. Um, and I'll show you in a second what, what some of those changes are. But pay attention to number five, the macroscopic changes. You see the benign uh, papule that's being followed is very symmetric. Obviously, that's something that's more atypical is growing. Melanoma in situ is irregular. And you see the irregular borders, the irregular shapes. And then something more invasive is obviously much more atypical. From that, you know, you correlate that to line number three, where the prem and the link genes are, are being expressed. And I'll explain what those are in a second. You see their gene expression is very high. You see the green line transitioning to the yellow line. Uh, and that's where, again, we, you know, when, when we have no risk that goes to moderate risk, that goes to high risk, that's where we, we see the interpretation of those being uh, broadcast and, and uh, presented to us in the reports. So link is the long intergenic non-coding RNA gene, if you will, that's a, or gene profile. That's the, uh, that's been created by DermTech and it's, it's one that's been overexpressed in melanoma. And that gene profile, again, goes back to a, a family of, of RNA molecules, which is important in the way that cancer grows versus prein, which is a preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma. It's a little bit more of progressive of, of expression in melanoma. And that's been also, validated by other diagnostic platforms. So again, these are the two um, markers that we're studying. And this is what the report looks like when we get it back. You see the, the lower, the green uh, report says that there's nothing ex expressive or expressed that looks like melanoma. You know, obviously this, this uh, lesion can be watched versus something that's moderate. It has either one of the genes expressing but this is again where, for me, I would say, okay, well, that's enough information. I need to cut the whole thing out and send it to the lab. And that, at least that's something I can translate to the patient also that says, okay, well, based on the test, now we know we have something that tells us even more that this mole is atypical. So let's set it up to, 
to get rid of it. And then the high red means both the, the genes are um, are being are being uh, considered positive. And that's where, again, you keep a very high index of suspicion, not just for cutting it out, but do we want to set that patient up for possibly more testing or at least understanding of, of the role of you know constant surveillance from there on? Because some patients may come in just thinking they're going to get a mole check on one mole. You know, we screen their whole body map and then all of a sudden we're screening them routinely. So this is, again, a lot of discussion points with patients. But again, when we have more information for that discussion, it makes that easier for, for them to digest a lot of that information. And again, you know, so again, the way we look at you know, some of the algorithms from it, for me, if any of those or both are positive, we're taking the whole thing out, uh, sending it to the lab. If both of them are negative, I mean, I still give the patient the option um, of what they want to do. But then at least we have a little bit of encouraging news that we're not in any big rush to, to cut anything out. And I think that, uh, especially, you know, I, I have a lot of patients where these moles are on the, the mid chest, they're on the face, the back of the neck, uh, tops of the feet. I mean, these, these are areas that are obviously are not the best places to do surgery, but again, we, we still want to make sure that, that we put the patient's mind at ease as well as reduce their risk. Now, the cost of analysis is there. I mean, there are costs to the uh, surgeries, costs to regular, to the pathology and everything else. And if we're saving some of that cost with these tests and being a little bit more conservative, I don't think it's a bad idea for the right patient. For the patient who's at higher risk, I probably would, again, still err on the side of taking a biopsy. But at the patient who's a lower risk or when we know that the index of suspicion is less or we're dealing with an aesthetically sensitive area or a cosmetic subunit on the body, I think we'd make these decisions um, you know, in tandem, and we would kind of make a plan for the long run, not just what are we going to do today, but what are we going to do six months from now, and what are we going to do if something is positive. So I think these all come into play. Anyway, there's a lot of discussion of, of what are the scenarios. I mean, this was a, uh, this was part of a case report, uh, W University of Utah. I mean, they, you know, talked about a lot of these different cases. Here's a 64 year old man. He had seven melanomas, right? He's had 30 atypical papula and, and areas on the face, trunk, and extremities that are you know, suspicious. You know, obviously they've taken photographs. He's had a bunch of biopsies done. He's had a bunch of surgeries done. And this is someone who's probably tired of needles and 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 surgery blades and, and probably looking for something else. This is where these assays can be very helpful uh, for the testing to again figure out sequentially which ones to to deal with. And as you found in the case, you know, 10 moles were tested, but four of them actually were found to be positive. And and this is obviously a patient who's at high risk of metastasis as well as you know systemic disease. So we have to be very cognizant of that patient's outcomes. This is another patient, again, you know, additional 10 moles were tested and here's two more that were positive for melanoma. Unfortunately, they're in situ and or very uh, minimally invasive and they're easily handled um, when those patients you know, are screened and, and watched carefully. So again, you know, how do these cases show us? Well, again, we're looking at you know the, the PLA testing, we're looking at the concordance, you know, the, the concordance of the moles and the and the positive testing for telling us what are what are how do we stratify this patient in terms of risk? And again, how are we following these patients through? And that's that's where again the assays are giving us these tools for that. So I know a lot of patients are you know are concerned about their moles. If you remember this Austin Powers uh, funny meme from being moly, 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 that was uh uh, pretty interesting way to end the movie. Um, but I think it's very important, again, for, for those of you concerned about your, your own moles, as well as, you know, for concern with melanoma as a whole and encouraging good screening, as well as uh, the importance of diagnostics, I think we uh, want to take into account, you know, all the different ways to um, use these tools to our advantage. So from that, I think, Kylie, I think I'll pass it back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. That was excellent. I think it's so timely because so many patients have put off dermatology visits because of COVID. Um, and, you know, especially people who are high risk who need to be seen every three months. I think it's a really good timely reminder to A, see their dermatologist, B, check your own skin. Um, and people can, again, get a skin check guide at the MRF website, melanoma.org and view our resources there. But I think I think it's really important and um, this is really great information for our community. So we encourage people to put questions in the comments section of the Facebook page. We're gonna to get to those again. The information that was presented today is, is for educational purposes and any specific treatment options should be directed to your healthcare provider. 
So we really want to encourage people to follow up with their dermatologists if they see something. Um, so with that, I'm going to start off by asking a couple questions, Dr. Bhatia, and these are sort of questions that we get all the time at the MRF, and and hopefully um, you know you can help clarify them. But people are often confused about the difference between genomics and genetics in terms of testing. Can you help define those two? Yeah, so it's a common common misconception about the two words. I mean, genetics is uh, not to be too uh, layman's terms, but you think about 23andMe, uh, that's your DNA, right? Your DNA is what makes you who you are. And genetic testing is based on that angle of what makes the fabric of, of who you are and what your diseases disease risks are as a whole. Versus genomics, I think, are a little bit more specific to tissue as well as uh, different parts of pathology. Uh, and, and I hope I'm explaining this in a way that's it's simple, but I, I look at the genomics of a tumor as being able to guide us to its potential severity as well as the risk of more severe disease or metastatic disease to that patient. Versus genetic testing is okay, I'm healthy, but what's my risk of getting such and such disease? So that's a different way of testing. And accuracy and uh, everything else aside, um, you know, people could do genetic testing for melanoma, but if they don't have anything atypical, they would not benefit from genomic testing. So I guess that's one way of looking at it. Okay, I think that helps clarify. Um, so we talked a little, you talked about biopsies and most people are used to getting biopsies, right? They get the punch biopsy, they get the shave biopsy. Um, this is a different form of a test because it's, it's a sticker, right? And that, that takes off the top layer of, of cells that can be analyzed. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the typical patient, you know, this is obviously not replacing the biopsy, but it's another tool. And you address this a little bit, but, but what kind of patient would you typically sort of use this on? Um, and then again, talk a little bit about the biopsy. Yeah. And, and, and you hear it on that. It, it's not a replacement for a biopsy. It's not meant to say do this because biopsies are unnecessary. For me, it helps me, I think, for preparing the patient for the right kind of biopsy or maybe no biopsy at all. Um, so if I have a patient with uh, something that I'm not concerned about the risk of melanoma, and it's a little bit more flat, a shave biopsy would probably be okay because you're, you're probably not going to be too concerned about the depth of the spot versus another type of mole that is clinically appearing from a deeper layer of the skin. You'd probably want to perform a punch biopsy to make sure that all of it is taken out so that you're getting the depth. But the risk with the punch biopsy is you're missing the lateral margins. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say missing, but you know, it, it's incorporating more of the deep margins unless you use a larger punch. Versus a shave biopsy, I, I hate to say, is a little bit technique dependent uh, because you know sometimes there's a little bit of fragmenting of the specimen or you can get a little bit deeper or the, the deeper margin might be left out. So the excisional biopsy is where we take a margin around and we basically take like a football or elliptical shape around that mole, get the entire surrounding tissue to make sure there's no lateral spread and then send that to the lab. Now, we could be doing that for every mole on the body, but then that's a lot of scar, that's a lot of suture, and that's a lot of procedure for something that may not need that. So you kind of, you know, again, this is why we go to school and we go to training, because then we can determine based on that, which is the right biopsy for the right, you know, type of neoplasm. But the bottom line comes to, you know, again, where does this test fit in? There's no reason this test couldn't fit in anywhere. But again, I think it drives me to say, all right, here's this atypical mold. Now we have more information. Let's go straight to cutting it out rather than taking a small piece of it and then having to go back and do another test. Uh, the flip side is if it's a cosmetically sensitive area, like on the cheek or on, you know, on the decollete or, you know, again, like the back of the neck or the back of the hands where the skin is thinner, you know, I might opt for taking the, the PLA test and say, all right, well, let's see what the risk really is. And then is there a way to, you know, to expedite doing the whole bio, uh, whole excision and saving again, that extra test. So 
I, I again, I try to take the word unnecessary out of the equation because it sounds very negative, but um, choosing the right biopsy based on the on the most information, I think will get the patients more security of the of what's going to happen next. Yeah, absolutely. So is this test, you know, for people watching, is this widely available? Is this something that anyone could walk into their dermatologist office and say, hey, I heard about this new, this new test. Is this something that I could get? How, how widely known is this new form of non-invasive testing? Well, in the, in the dermatology world, it's very well known. And most everyone is aware of it or how to get it. If they're not, it's, uh, if the patients are aware of it, you know, every dermatology office could figure out a way to get the patients uh, tested. There, that's, that's not a, an issue. There's no obstacle to that. Uh, whether it's covered by insurance or payment or HSA, I mean, that's very individual. Uh, that's, that's really not for me to, to say, but I, I know DermTech has done a lot for uh, making the test available for patients, and they have a program of um, working through that with every dermatology office. I know during the, the pandemic, at its worst, uh, patients were actually sent the test home, and they could do it at home and then send it in themselves uh, if they were given the right training on the technique. Obviously, that's the a little bit risky if you're not trained, but you know it's it's not a technically very difficult test to perform as as you saw from the video. It just takes the right steps. Uh, that being said, I, I think it, you know I would just cons have everybody consult with their dermatologist and say I, I, I've heard about this test. Uh, is it a, is it the right test for me? Will it you know is there a mole I have or something that I have that would benefit from being tested this way? And I think that way, you know, it, it takes some of that discussion or ambiguity out of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. But it is well known in the dermatology community, and it is definitely something that a patient could could bring up. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, both DermTech and Castle uh, have done a lot in the past couple of years for not only making these tests uh, again available not just to dermatologists and pathologists, but making the um, understanding of their utility to dermatologists. Uh, well known, and I, I think we're on a we're in a good spot with you know the support that that all of these companies have done, uh, DermTech and Castle specifically for um, helping the community and, and helping melanoma uh, diagnostics. Absolutely. So as we as we wrap up, one final question, and you touched on this a little bit at the at the beginning. You know, the best way to never get melanoma is to pre prevent it to start off with, right? To protect your skin to use um, sunscreen, to wear UPF clothing. What advice would you have for our viewers in the winter? I know there's a lot of misconceptions because it's colder, um, yeah. but what, what's the advice you give your patients? Well, again, I mean, it, it's not the temperature that causes uh, skin cancer, it's ultraviolet light. Uh, but I, I always have fun with this analogy. It's like, why, why do we brush our teeth? We're not treating anything when you brush our teeth, right? You're preventing problems. And you don't just brush one tooth, you brush all your teeth, right? So why do you use sunscreen? You're not treating anything with sunscreen. You're preventing a problem with sunscreen. And you shouldn't just be putting sunscreen on your nose. You should be putting it everywhere that's exposed, right? So I have the same analogy with my patients. I say, look, if you want to prevent problems, you put sunscreen on to prevent getting sunburn, pre to prevent your risk of aging and skin cancer. But also, it doesn't matter what season it is. It doesn't matter what temperature it is. You do the same thing every day, and you're going to prevent problems rather than you know, have to chase them later. So the same, you know, obviously, you know, the skiers uh, have the same problems as the hikers and the surfers do. You're, you're exposed to the double whammy of direct ultraviolet light at an altitude and then the snow bouncing off of you, right? Same thing with surfers in the water and same thing with hikers at altitude in, in the sun and whatever. I mean, it, it's the same mentality, whether you're walking to the grocery store or you're laying out at the beach, it's the same exact sun and you have to protect yourself the same exact way. Absolutely. Thank you. Great advice for our community. Um, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bhatia, for your time today, your expertise, and for sharing such great educational information with our community. This concludes our first Ask the Experts series presented by DermTech. If you're looking for more educational resources, we encourage you to visit the MRF's website, melanoma.org. We have an education institute with a lot of great information, resources. We also have an Ask the Nurse program um, to assist patients directly. So please, please go to our website. Um, we will be hosting our second Ask the Experts series on Thursday, January 14th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m. 
Pacific, again, live via our Facebook page. We'll hear presentations from Dr. Ann Mazur Reed, who is the Medical Director of Research at the Rendon Center, and Dr. Daniel Siegel, Clinical Professor of Dermatology at Sunny Down State, who will discuss the importance and challenges that come with early detection. So again, a big thank you to our partners at DermTech. Thank you, Dr. Bhatti, again for your time and great presentation. And we will see you all next Thursday. Thank you.